This is Genesis 32, verses 22 through 31. Let us listen to the Word of God. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. This is the word of the Lord. I will thank Hannah. It's good to see y'all, by the way. Uh, in her 23 years, there's countless times that she has run to my office to get me stuff that I forget. And so I thank you. It's kind of old time's sake, okay? So we did that. Since the beginning of May, we have been involved in a sermon series. And this sermon series has been a little bit different than what I normally do because it's a sermon series that has two parts. The overall series is has been about looking at some of the great people of faith that we encounter in the Bible. Now, during May, when we were observing Mother's Day, we turned our focus to some of the great women of the Bible. We looked at Hannah and her prayer of faith, asking God, for what she most wanted was a male child, a child that she would then dedicate to God. We then turned to um, Lois and Eunice, the grandmother and mother of Timothy, and we looked at their faith and, and how their faith was so strong and how they shared that faith and passed it on to Timothy. We looked at a woman with no name, but she was a sinner, the unnamed sinner, who came into Jesus and anointed his feet with her tears and dried his feet with her hair. Then we looked at Mary, the mother of Jesus, and how she was a willing servant to be used by God. So this week, in, in the, uh, this month, in June, celebrating Father's Day as we are today, we are focusing in on some of the great men of faith. We began with Peter on the day of Pentecost, and we saw how Peter, despite his denial and his betrayal of Jesus when he was arrested, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and gave a sermon, a sermon that was so powerful that 3,000 people came to faith. Last week, we looked at Abraham and how Abraham's faith was so strong that when God came and said, Abraham, I want you to go somewhere, I'm just not going to tell you where... But leave everything you know, Abraham did it. And now we're here today. Now Thursday, as I was, Thursday is my writing day. Thursday is when I spend, I spend the bulk of my time writing at least, uh, the sermon. And it strikes me that I kind of feel the need to apologize. Because on Mother's Day, if you were here for Mother's Day, you know that we looked at Lois and Eunice, two terrific women of faith. I mean, examples of faithful living, of faithful discipleship, of witnessing and all of that. I mean, who wouldn't want to be like Lois and Eunice, right? Well, today we're going to be looking at Jacob. And as we talk about Jacob, you're going to 
maybe see why I feel the need to apologize to all of the men, particularly fathers today, because with the women, we had Lois and Eunice, terrific examples, and I'm giving you Jacob. Who was Jacob? Jacob was the son of Isaac and Rebekah. He was the twin to Esau. And Jacob would grow up to be the father of 12 sons who would become the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, you may be thinking, if you're not familiar with Jacob, well, that doesn't sound so bad. We could all ascribe to do that. Well, yeah, if that's all we know, Jacob is a pretty good guy. But we do need to remember Jacob and his brother Esau. Because even before they were born, they were doing what siblings often do. They were fighting. They were struggling. In, in, in uh, Rebecca's womb, they were struggling. When Esau was born, when he came out, Jacob had hold of his heel. In another church that I served, there was a, a member who happened to be an elder. He wasn't on the session while I was there, I don't believe. But he and I used to go visit together. And he worked in the office some. And he had a favorite word. His favorite word was scoundrel. Scoundrel? Scoundrel. And he would use that in a sentence more than anybody I knew. Oh, do you know so-and-so? Oh, he's such a scoundrel. What's a scoundrel? Well, a scoundrel really, by definition, is a dishonest and unscrupulous person. And I hate to say this. Jacob is a scoundrel. You see, one day Jacob was in the kitchen and he was making lunch. He was making this stew and it smelled so good. His brother Esau comes in. He'd been out all day and he was famished. He was hungry. He just knew he was starving to death and if he didn't get something to eat, he was going to die. So he said, brother that I love so much, can I have a little bit of your stew? Jacob said, yeah, but you got to give me your birthright. So he kind of bribed his birthright out of him. Well, that's one thing. But then later on, as his father Isaac was laying in his deathbed, Jacob, with the help of his mother, which is a whole nother story, disguised himself because his father couldn't see. So he put uh, um, animal skin and animal fur on his arms and he went to him and he tricked his father into giving him his deathbed blessing that should have gone to Esau. So twice now we see Jacob, the scoundrel, stealing what was rightfully Esau's. Stole his birthright and then stole the blessing of his father. Well, Jacob kind of knew what he did wasn't right. He knew that he was a scoundrel. So he feared his brother's retaliation, so he ran away to live with his uncle Laban. And I'm thinking of all the folks in the Bible, Jacob and Laban were made for each other. Because their relationship was defined by mutual trickery. So, while Jacob is at Laban's, he falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel, and he wants to marry Rachel. So Laban says, you can marry her. But you got to work for me seven years. Those seven years flew by, I think. I think Jacob's so much in love with Rachel, those years went by. And when the time came... Laban turned the tables and he tricked him into marrying her, his other daughter, Leah. Jacob got a little bit of his own medicine. But he still loved Rachel, so, so Laban said, well, you know what, just work for me another seven years and you can have Rachel as well. And so he did. But not to be outdone, Jacob turns the tables now on, on Laban. And so he tricks him so that he, Jacob, ends up with a stronger and more numerous offspring from the flocks. So their whole relationship was about tricking one another. You see, Jacob was a real scoundrel. So maybe it's an odd choice to preach on Jacob when we are exploring some of the great people of faith. It may also seem odd to you, and this is where my apology comes, that I'm preaching on Jacob on Father's Day. You may be going, what lesson do we get from Jacob? Here's one lesson. Dads, don't be like Jacob. Don't be a scoundrel. It's not a bad lesson. 
But i got to think, this story and, and the person of Jacob is here for more than the lesson of don't be a scoundrel. I think there's something more. And I think part of that something more is that the story isn't over. Jacob has spent his life deceiving and lying to those closest to him. His brother, his father, his uncle, or his father and his uncle who becomes his father-in-law and others. But remember Paul Harvey who would say, and now the rest of the story. Don't give up on Jacob yet. The story isn't over. When we pick up the story today, it's in the dark of night, which is so important. So many things happen in the Bible also in the dark of night. It's pretty significant. You see, in the dark of night and the quiet stillness, as we lie motionless in bed, that's when God often begins to speak and work in us. The dark of night. The dark of night, so many things happen. The dark of night or when the boogeyman, it's when the boogeyman comes out. My grandmother lived out in the country. My grandparents, my dad's parents lived way out in the country. I don't know if you ever remember Hannah going out to the country. My friend in college, uh, he went out there with me once and he said, your grandmother lives so far out in the country she gets Saturday night live on the next Thursday. It was way out there. Now, during the day, we would play outside and we would run all around their house. But at night, you didn't go behind the house. God knows what was out there. We didn't want to. When we moved to South Carolina, the whole back of my parents' house was like one glass wall, sliding glass doors. And they were out of town one night. I was a senior in high school. I was playing the piano, and this glass globe fell off the piano, probably from the vibrations of the piano, but I just knew it was some kind of satanic being. And I made the mistake when that happened. I looked out the window, and behind our house was nothing but woods. Do you know how many eyeballs I think were staring back at me? You never look into the woods at night because you will see things. So being the brave senior in high school that I was, I went to bed. I left the shattered glass on the floor and every light on because we all know from the horror movies, creatures like darkness, okay? So we left every light on. The dark of night. All kinds of things happen in the dark of night. God often begins to speak to us in the dark of night. How many of you have been laying in bed at night? Maybe you can't sleep and your mind begins to go or you begin to feel God's presence. I've had some very powerful prayers in the dark of night. In the quietness of that night. Jacob is alone in the dark of night. And he begins to wrestle with the man. The man isn't identified officially, but we know that this is God. It's God personified as an angel or a human figure. But make no mistake, Jacob is in a wrestling match with his heavenly father. And it's in the dark of night. Now much is made over the fact that neither this man who is God or Jacob is able to prevail over one another. But it is interesting that as the sun is coming up, all this man, this God man does is touch Jacob's hip and immediately his hip is out of socket. The power rests with this other man, but Jacob is wrestling with him. And though he is wounded, and you assume in pain, Jacob holds tightly to this mysterious man and demands a blessing. And this is where we need to start paying attention to Jacob. He wrestled with God. And not only did he wrestle with God, he clung to God and he wouldn't let go. Jacob, who was a scoundrel, a cheat, a liar, a deceiver, wrestled with God and sought His blessing. Tumbling and struggling through the night, He wouldn't let go because He wanted that blessing. All through the night, He wrestled. How often have you wrestled with God? How often have you struggled with God? Maybe you're struggling with God, wrestling with God now. Perhaps you were wrestling with God over His plans for your life. So I don't know about you, there are times of what I thought my plans ought to be, God had different plans. I thought I was going to be a music teacher. I knew, I thought I was going to be a music teacher and I knew who God wanted me to marry. The only difference was neither one of those was in God's plans. 
Maybe you wrestle with God over what your, His plans for you really are. Maybe you're wrestling with God over your present circumstances, things that you're facing and going through. Maybe you're struggling because you're trying to live faithfully. You want to live faithfully, but there's constantly a temptation in front of you. And we're all, or we, we know that. God, why do you keep putting this out there? You know I love jelly beans. You know I love Mexican. Those are minor. Maybe there's other serious, really serious temptations that keep staring you in the face. Wouldn't it be easier if they weren't there? God, you want me to be faithful? Take these away from me. Maybe... You're wrestling with God as you strive to find what your purpose and your direction is. I don't know what your struggle with God right now is, but I do know this. All of us struggle with God. If not right now, at some point. If you're not doing it now, wait a few days. You're going to be, we all wrestle with God. We struggle with God. And like Jacob, when we find ourselves struggling with God, we need to cling to Him and not let go. Don't give up. Because we need to Seek after His blessing. And when Jacob asked for the blessing, the man God asked for Jacob's name. And there's a couple of things at play here. They understood that a name was more than an identity. Now, my name identifies me. I am Joseph. So when someone asks, who are you? I am Joseph. So they certainly understood the name as identifying you as who you were, but it also spoke to your character, your nature. So when in this wrestling match, Jacob says, bless me, and he says, what is your name? Jacob had to give his name. I am Jacob. That identified him. But it also identified something about his character. It said that I am the heel grabber. I am the deceiver. I am the trickster. I am Jacob, and I'm a scoundrel. In a sense, by giving his name, what Jacob is doing is confessing who he is. With all of his strengths and with all of his weaknesses. With all of the things he's done well and all the ways he has been a failure. And when he makes that confession, this man, God, gave him a new name and a new identity. He would now be known as Israel, which means that he had striven with both God and humans and had prevailed. Here's a few things to keep in mind. Jacob wrestled with God through the night, and he didn't come out of that struggle the same. First, after wrestling with God through the night, he walked with a limp. Remember, as the day began to break, God reached up, touched that hip, knocked it out of joint. Jacob was forever marked and forever changed. When we wrestle with God, when we are in that intimate relationship with Him, we will not be the same. We will be changed. And sometimes the way that God is working in our life hurts. Many times it's not easy. It can be painful. It can be difficult. But in the end, it's going to be for our good. And then out of this struggle with God, Jacob receives a new name. And as I'm reading this and working over this during the week, all I could do was think about baptism. You see, when we baptize someone, we don't, don't bring them to the font and dump water on them. What do we ask for? What is your name? Years ago, I held Hannah and I said, Hannah Elizabeth Washburn, you are a child of the covenant. And in doing so, I claimed, her mother and I, we claimed God's promises for her, and we accepted the reality that she belonged to God. She had an identity. It wasn't just that she was our daughter. She belonged to God. When we go through the waters of baptism, we are named as children of God, children of the covenant, that we belong ultimately not to ourselves, not to our parents, not to anything in this world, but to God. Jacob, receives a new name from God. And just as our names are spoken in the waters of baptism, we are claimed in the kingdom, so would Jacob. So in this Father's Day, we've explored one of the real scoundrels of the Bible, Jacob. But through this scoundrel, we see that God does not give up on us. While the first part of his life 
is marked by dishonesty and deceit. The rest of the story is that God gets a hold of him and changes him. So may we hold on tenaciously to God, even though it will likely change us, and it may be painful, but ultimately trust God that it will be for our good and His glory. But may we also know that through the waters of baptism, we have been called by name, that we belong to God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we do thank you for your love and your presence in our lives. We thank you for the ways that you wrestle with us and you won't let us just always take the easy way out. We thank you for the ways that we walk through this life and we're not alone. So guide us and lead us and strengthen us. And Lord, remind us that we belong to you, that we are part of the kingdom, and that our story is not over yet. In Christ's name, amen.